TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. And all around the world. Because as you can see by the title of this video, we might go around. The world. I don't even know how the FBI work, honestly. Wherever you at, they're going to get you. Free Dirk. Uh, little warning screens, you see it. Twitch.com is where you can catch the live streams. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. And we also got Patreon where we post five to ten times a week. This is the FBI's ten most wanted. Exp oh, it's explained. Okay. I don't know. How do you get on this list? Like, what do you... All right. Let's just... Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. I'm just curious. This is good. This is this should be good. For almost 75 years, the FBI's top 10 most wanted list has helped bring down some of the nation's most dangerous criminals. As for what makes the list special, it only features criminals that the FBI deems to be especially serious threats to society. And to get on it, you basically have to do something extremely messed up or have a very lengthy record of major crimes. The story behind the list goes that back in 1949, a reporter asked the FBI to list out the 10 toughest guys that they were trying to catch so they could ask the public for help. After obtaining the list, the reporter published the criminals' pictures on the front page of the Washington Daily News, and the rest is history. Since then, the FBI has been able to catch almost 500 wanted fugitives thanks to public tips. I'm telling you, I already know this, man. It's always somebody not minding their business. But I guess it's always somebody not minding their business that's willing to give a free tip. And I'm almost positive these dudes got like, like, like bounties or whatever. Like there's cash, cash involved. Yeah, if your information leads to the capture of this fugitive, you get X amount of dollar type energy. Those people probably make a lip. Well, bounty hunters. But not for the FBI. It's probably hit different. Anyway. These are the current criminals on the list. Let's look Badresh Kumar Shetanbhai Patel. On Badresh Kumar Shetanbhai Patel. Okay, that wasn't that bad. On April 12, 2015, a CCTV camera captured two Dunkin' Donuts employees, one male and one female, walking towards the shop's back room at around 9.30 p.m. before disappearing from view. A few seconds later, the man comes back into the camera's view, and it seems as if nothing out of the ordinary took place in the minute that went down between the two clips. A few minutes later, customers alerted the police when they didn't see any employees in the shop, and that's when the cops discovered something horrifying. Lying on the floor of the shop's back room was an Indian woman named Palak, lifeless, who had been pummeled to death by the man in the footage. As it was later revealed, the man who took Palak's life was her husband, Badrish Kumar. As the authorities wow. later... Wow. So... I'm, I'm guessing this is their own business? They, they, this is not funny. They got into a lover's quorum in the back silently? What happened? learned the couple had been through a series of major arguments in the months leading up to that day. According to court documents, the two of their visas were about to expire in a few weeks. Palak wanted to go back to India, but Badrish Kumar wanted to stay in the US, and it looks like he couldn't find a better way to communicate his frustration with the situation than to brutally take his wife's life. After the crime, Badrish Kumar was last seen taking a taxi from a hotel in New Jersey to a train station in Newark. But what he did after that is really anyone's guess. Buddy is out of the country somewhere. How did this land? Come on, FBI, though. To bring more attention to a suspect who might otherwise walk away scot free, the FBI placed him on the most wanted list. As of today. Federal Bureau of Investigation. Do, uh, do all unsolved murders go to the FBI? Not unsolved, but like. If you can't find the person that did it? Today, there's a quarter million dollar reward to bring the suspect into custody. Quarter million? I'll make a few phone calls. Hold on. But almost 10 years after the crime, it looks like that won't happen anytime soon. Yeah, but he's definitely somewhere in his home country. Chilling. Y'all not finding him. It's, it's done. 
Alejandro Rosales Castillo. The youngest suspect on the most wanted list, 26-year-old Alejandro Rosales Castillo, has been on the FBI's radar for more than eight years. In 2016, he shot his female co-worker, Sandy Lee, in a wooded area in Cabarrus County, North Carolina. What's up with people shooting their co-workers and, and doing stuff at work? This is why when I was in the working industry, I would never befriend my co-workers. Like, not to, to, the, to this extent. You know what I'm saying? Oh, let's go kick it. I don't know you. All you do is clock in and clock out and... And work. That's all I know. Like, I don't know your background. I, I don't know nothing. I'm not, I don't want to be your friend. A few days later, the female victim's car was located at a bus station in Phoenix, Arizona. As the authorities later found out, there were multiple people involved in the case, with the main ones being the victim, a woman named Amia Feaster, and Alejandro himself, all of whom worked together at a restaurant in Charlotte. During the investigation, the cops learned that Sandy Lee and Alejandro together at a restaurant in Charlotte. Greek. During the investigation, the cops learned that Sandy Lee and Alejandro had briefly dated, and after their breakup, Castillo started dating his other co-worker, Amia Feaster. Dang. So he was in even deeper. He was dating co-workers. This is a toxic work environment. This is another thing you definitely don't do. Do not no pleasure where you uh, make your where you make your living at don't mix they don't mix well i know you there eight hours a day with one person and you might have a crut like but leave it at that no relationships according to court documents sandy lee had apparently lent some money to alejandro and on august 9th of that year he texted her to meet up with him at a quick trip located on eastway drive in charlotte claiming that he was going to pay her back Disturbingly, that's when Castillo decided to rob her at gunpoint, take her life, and flee to Mexico. In an eerie clip of CCTV footage that was later released by the authorities, the suspect can be seen crossing the Mexican border through Nogales, Arizona, along with his girlfriend, Amia. A couple of months later that same year, Amia turned herself into the authorities in Mexico and was charged with accessory after the fact of Yeah, accessory after the fact? What, that carry 10 years? You gone. Felony murder and larceny of a motor vehicle. Hello. Based on her testimony, she and Alejandro had been staying with the killer's cousin. At some point, Castillo had once again disappeared with no explanation, and that's when she decided to turn herself in. As of 2024, the FBI has no further clues that could lead to Castillo's arrest. How long did she get for accessory to murder? Right now, all they know is that he's probably still living in Mexico. The last time he was seen, he wore his hair short and shaved on the sides, but that's pretty much all they have to go on. Bro probably got a full grown, I'm talking Baywatch, you know what I'm saying, what's the, what's the name that was on Baywatch with the long hair, he got one of them probably. As of today, there's still a quarter million dollar reward out for his arrest, but there have been no further updates on his case. Quarter million? Before we move on, I wanted to take- Hey man, listen, this is great. This is great. I honestly salute that you got to pay the bills, but me personally? It's a long one too, wasn't it? Ruzha Ignatova In 2016, the Bulgarian entrepreneur Ruzha Ignatova stepped on stage in a beautiful red dress at the Coin Rush Global event in Wembley, London to talk about her vision for the future Ooh, in London. of her crypto company, OneCoin. During the presentation, she claimed that in two years, everyone would forget about Bitcoin and that OneCoin would dominate the crypto world as the one true cryptocurrency. I remember OneCoin. I remember, I remember I had Bitcoin and sold it. <sighs> Biggest mistake. I don't even like to think about it, but anyway. See, it's hard to imagine that any of her excited, applauding investors knew that they were stepping into what was later described by the New York Times as one of the biggest scams in history. For several years, Ruja, or the crypto queen as she's known nowadays, promised her buyers a five-fold and even ten-fold return on their investment in one coin. she had the perfect scam people were so fumbling and bumbling and willing to do anything for the next big coin they was ready listening when people getting the promise and stuff that seems undeliverable i'm not going for it you know what i'm saying normally these kinds of claims are an immediate red flag exactly 
But because the entire world was scrambling to get on the crypto action, a ton of investors jumped at the opportunity without thinking twice, resulting in a massive OneCoin buying frenzy. Between 2014 and 2016, OneCoin raked in more than $4 billion from unsuspecting investors, with more than $50 million coming from investors in the US. As the investors learned when they bought into OneCoin, the company was pretty much a pyramid scheme in which they were rewarded for recruiting their friends to buy it as well. And for a while, the shady multi-level marketing model seemed to be working for Ruja. However, in 2016, a lot of our investors started complaining that they were really struggling to sell their OneCoins and that they didn't see how they'd ever recoup their investments. Word started to spread online that OneCoin was a scam, which drew the attention of the media as well as federal investigators. Unfortunately, it was a little too late by that. Shorty was out the, <laughs> out the jam. Seashell, what is it? Shell Corporation set up. Uh, banks and... In, in, overseas you can't get this money she got four billion dollars less than a year and a half after a presentation in Wembley Ruja got on a plane from Bulgaria to Greece and was never seen again disturbingly during the invest and four billion dollars richer at the end of the day her money is probably so well hidden, like it's capped, <laughs> you're done for. Investigations, a bunch of really messed up emails written by Ruja were leaked by federal investigators in which the crypto queen made it more than clear that she knew she was scamming people out of their hard-earned money from the very start. In some of her emails, she admitted that the company wasn't actually mining any coins, that her coin was trash, and that her investors were idiots for trusting her. In one of her emails, she proposed an exit strategy to her partner Carl Greenwood, which consisted of taking the money, running away, and blaming somebody else for the whole thing. She was ready to scapegoat somebody. During the investigation, Carl ended up pleading guilty to wire fraud and conspiracy to launder money, for which he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Damn! He got a dub for wire fraud and money la Yeah. Fed time, too. Probably in some white collar. I don't know. He got. As it was later revealed, the FBI had been on to Ruja long before she fled from Bulgaria, even recruiting her American boyfriend to look into her company's practices for them. After learning about her extremely they had an inside man and everything, bro, a snitch. sketchy business practices and her grand scheme to steal billions of dollars from investors all around the world, she was charged with wire fraud, money laundering, and securities fraud. Security this promptly spot. landed her a spot on the FBI's most wanted list, becoming only the 11th woman to earn that distinction. Looking into her past to find clues as to what could have influenced Ruja to do something so nefarious, federal investigators found some pretty interesting stuff. Such as? As it turns out, Ruja was fluent in four languages, was extremely intelligent, once had a job at a high-ranking consulting firm, and had been obsessed with fashion and maintaining her image from a very young age. The, the love of money is the root of all evil. And she had it drilled in her head. She had to maintain a certain lifestyle and scammed hundreds of thousands of people out of billions of dollars to do so. I ain't gonna lie. So far, I hope they catch her. I hate scammers. I hope they get her. It was only with the benefit of hindsight that prosecutors were able to clearly see how she used all these qualities to carry out her malicious plans. Too late now. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like the FBI will find her anytime soon. It's been rumored that after fleeing the country, the crypto queen may have drastically altered her appearance with plastic surgery. 100%. If them Barbie people can do it that look like Ken and, and, and whatever, and Barbie, she could do it. And is believed to travel with armed guards at all times. Disturbingly, there have also been several allegations that she was murdered by an accomplice, but this hasn't been proven. If she is still alive, the FBI suspects Ruja is traveling on a German passport to the United Arab Emirates, Bulgaria, Germany, Russia, Greece, and multiple countries in Eastern Europe. Considering how still elusive rich. she's been since her disappearance almost eight years ago, it's unlikely the FBI will ever find out what became of Ruja Ignatova after pulling off one of the largest financial scams in history. That's crazy. Four billion. She finessed four billion. This is the top finesser of all time. She should go down in a Guinness Book of World Record for finessing. Punch made dev. Um, them call centers. Them Africans don't got nothing on her. Like this, it get it gets spooky right now. Arnaldo Jimenez. 
On May 12, 2012, Arnaldo Jimenez and his wife Estrella went out to celebrate their wedding in a black 2006 four-door Maserati. Less than 24 hours after the couple had said their vows, Arnaldo knifed his wife to death in the car, dragged her into the bathroom tub of her apartment in Burbank, Illinois, and disappeared. In Illa this was in Illinois? I ain't never been to Burbank. That's close, I, I think. Let me see. 38 minute drive from downtown Chicago to Burbank, Illinois. Bro, what, he had to be on PCP or something. I don't, what is Appeared without a trace. That's unfortunate. R.I.P. to that woman. She thought she had started the best chapter in her life. And skipped right to the ending. That is tough. This thing gotta be careful, man. I wonder, did they date? Did she really know him? Did they know each other? Like, when Estrella didn't come back to pick up her kids at school the next day, her family called the cops, who ended up finding Estrella's remains still in her wedding dress in her bathtub. Immediately, a nationwide search for Arnaldo was launched, but by that time the suspect was long gone. During the investigation, it was revealed that Jimenez had reached out to a friend before fleeing and told him, if anyone asks where I am, tell them I went to Mexico. Since then, the authorities have received multiple tips that Jimenez may have fled to Durango or Tamaulipas, Mexico, where he's believed to be hiding out with family members. Initially, a $100,000 reward was issued for anyone with information that could lead to his arrest, but four years after he was placed on the most wanted list, the FBI increased the reward to a quarter million dollars. Burbank police have stated that in the past 12 years, they've received hundreds of tips about Arnaldo's whereabouts, but none of them have led to anything significant. Quarter million, so four of them is a, a, a million. Dang, I could be. T is it taxed? <laughs> I'm really trying to see something, bro. No, I'm just playing. After the crime, investigators traced his phone and determined that he had traveled from Chicago to Tennessee, then to Arkansas. Not Chicago, Burbank. Those are two different things, but continue and from there to Hidalgo, Texas, very close to the Mexican border. They were, unfortunately, unable to determine where he went after that. Police have also revealed that the car in which Arnaldo carried out his heinous crime was never found. If the suspect is ever caught, he'll be spending the rest of his life in prison for first-degree murder and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. But, based on how things have played out since the last time he was seen, it's unlikely Arnaldo will ever pay for his atrocious crime. Like, what went through his head? Like, I'm lost. Like, why would you do that? That is bogus. I want to know the backstory of their whole relationship. Vitello. Now you in Mexico. Can't do nothing fun. I mean, not saying. I mean, there is stuff, fun stuff. Can't do nothing fun that you're used to doing. Menacing. As the leader of one of Haiti's largest and most violent criminal gangs, Craze Barri, Vitel Ome Innocent, which do not let his name fool you, he is indeed not innocent, has terrorized the region for years, earning a spot on the FBI's most wanted list for his role in a string of brutal kidnappings and murders. In October 2021, he collaborated with the... I'm gonna stay quiet on this one. I'm in Florida. I don't know who he got out here. Let me just... Notorious 400 Mawozo gang to carry out the high-profile kidnapping of 17 Christian missionaries in Haiti. Disturbingly, five of the kidnapping victims were children, one as young as eight months old. Held at gunpoint, the hostages were reportedly kept captive for two months while the gangs demanded a ransom of one million dollars per hostage. It was only after an anonymous donor paid an undisclosed sum to Craze Barri and 400 Mawozo that the missionaries were finally released. Based on court documents, yeah, because 100% America does not negotiate with terrorists, so they wasn't giving that up. It, got, it had to be coming from somebody else, from an anonymous donor. Documents, Innocent and his crew ended up spending the ransom money on weapons. That same year, the Haitian president was assassinated, which caused Innocent's influence to grow exponentially. But, you see, that's why you don't do that negotiation thing. I kind of I kind of get it. They spent the money on weapons and overthrew the Haitian government. ...in the chaos that engulfed the country. In the aftermath of the assassination, Craigsbury claimed new territories and expanded their ranks quicker than the cops could even keep track of. In 2023, Craigsbury boasted an estimated 600 members, many of whom were young children who were involuntarily recruited to serve Innocent's criminal organization. Almost exactly one year after the kidnapping of the Christian missionaries, Craigsbury kidnapped two U.S. citizens under Innocent's orders, Marie Odette Franklin and Jean Franklin. 
Unfortunately, one of the victims did not survive, while the other was held for a $300,000 ransom. Somehow, innocents still managed to walk away scot-free. In April 2024, CNN released an interview where Innocent brazenly showed off his luxury home, which sticks out like a sore thumb in the extreme poverty surrounding. Yeah, man, you know how y'all, you can't, you, you gotta do something insane to go get that man. He on y'all list and walking around in broad daylight is what it seems, right? Surrounding him. Surrounded by gold rim couches and chairs, Innocent explained to the reporter how he came to power. In the interview, he shamelessly blamed Haiti's corruption on the country's politicians, refusing to take any responsibility for his own actions. Interestingly, he also alleged that before becoming the leader of Cranesbury, he had once owned multiple legitimate businesses, including a hotel and a rental car company, but said his companies were destroyed by the government. According to multiple crime analysts, Innocent was once a political activist before he turned to violent crime to maximize his influence. Back in the US, Innocent is wanted by the FBI for an insanely long list of crimes, including kidnapping for ransom, theft, murder, assault, vehicle theft, and destruction of property. There's a $2 million reward for information Damn, two million? leading to his arrest. But with he in Haiti, go get him. What if that's if that's what y'all want to do, ain't he? It seemed like he was just out there broad daylight, right? powerful connections and an armed gang, it'll be pretty tough to ever bring him to justice. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Y'all gonna have to do the most. There's gonna be another war. So Y'all gonna bring war to that. More war. Over there trying to get him. Omar Alexander Cardenas. In 2022, the FBI released two eerie before and after clips of a man walking into and then running away from a shopping mall area on August 15th, 2019. Bro, give him Peter Griffin. Teen. And running away from a shopping mall area on August 15th, 2019. The man oh, seen in the video is 29 year old Omar Alexander Cardenas. And let's just say that he didn't exactly go shopping in the time that elapsed between those two clips. Running. After disappearing, they're running away. That's a stretch. My fault. That's he didn't exactly go shopping in the time that elapsed between those two clips. After disappearing from the camera's view, Omar walked up to a man standing outside the Hair Icon Barber Shop at an outdoor shopping center and fired several rounds from his semi-automatic handgun at his head, killing him instantly. Dang. Immediately after committing the crime, Omar fled the scene a little after 4 p.m. as he can be seen in the eerie FBI footage. A suspected member of the Pierce Street Gang in Los Angeles, and often going by the nickname Dollar, Omar is suspected to have fled to Mexico to seek refuge among his relatives. In September 2021, a federal arrest warrant was issued. Bro, 400 pounds sliding, walking stuff down, and got away? For the suspect after he was charged with murder and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, thanks to which he was pinned on the most wanted billboard. Even though he committed a brutal crime pretty much in broad daylight and didn't exactly shy away from the cameras after doing it, the cops seem to know surprisingly little about Omar. The only things they really know about him are that he's around 300 pounds, wears thick, Damn. thick prescription glasses, Damn. has at least one tattoo, and is considered armed and dangerous. Bro got clapped up by a geek. That's tough. That's a lyric in a song. Dude, we're glad. That's... I was just quoting the lyric, don't, don't. Which alone is hardly enough to track down a criminal who's crossed international borders to flee prosecution. R.I.P. to that man, though. I'm, I'm pretty sure this was a gang-related incident. L.A. got crazy stuff going on. So. With time, hopefully more information will surface leading to his potential extradition and arrest. But for now, it looks like Omar will remain a most wanted criminal. Yulan Adonai Archaga Karayas. How many have we have we gone through? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six, six. Back in the 80s, a gang known as the Mara Salvatrucha was set up to protect Salvadorian immigrants from other gangs in the Los Angeles area. I remember that gang. I remember hearing about this game. Fast forward a couple of decades and the Mara, or the MS-13 for yeah. short, had become one of the most brutal and violent criminal organizations in the world. 
Nowadays, MS-13 has a strong presence in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, the US, Canada, and even Spain. They engage in all kinds of- This is another one of these cases where I'ma just <laughs> remain quiet. Criminal activity, from drug trafficking, human trafficking, extortion, murder, and racketeering, often using extreme violence to maintain their influence and control. For many years, a man named Yulan Adonai Archaga Karayas operated as the head of MS-13's criminal activities in Honduras, providing support and resources. Y'all yeah, can wrap this one up too. Y'all ain't gonna never catch this man. He gotta make major mistakes for you to catch him. Him and the Haitian dude, you're not gonna catch. The other ones, y'all, maybe. To the gang in Central America. It's too many people riding for this man. Okay, and the US with firearms, narcotics, and loads of cash. Often operating under his alias Porky, Yulan is wanted by the FBI for trafficking multi-ton loads of drugs through Honduras to the US and for the killing of several rival gang members. Among Porky's colorful criminal charges, you'll find everything from murder to racketeering conspiracy to drug importation to possession of machine guns. Even though he's only around 160 pounds, Yulan is considered one of the most powerful men in Honduras as the MS-13 gang has had the country in a chokehold for years. The most shocking part of the story is that at one point, Porky had already been apprehended by the Honduran authorities and was even taken to a courthouse for a hearing on charges. Yeah, I bet you that didn't last long. Not in Honduria, he got <laughs> What do that mean? Boy, they probably sent a, a, a 200 people to come get that man and y'all let him right go. I know y'all did. He's a murdering two Honduran prosecutors. But during the hearing, 20 armed men dressed up in the same clothes as the anti-gang police units walked into the building escorting a veiled suspect and suddenly opened fire on the guards. In Never mind, 20. In just a few seconds, the men subdued the guards and safely escorted Porky out of the courthouse, killing four police officers in the process. Told you, it's too much. They, this, is, this is a third world country gang boss. It's, 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 it's not gonna happen. In Honduria, y'all tried to y'all could have y'all should have flew him somewhere else. For obvious reasons, Porky is considered armed and extremely dangerous. Due to the sheer nature of his crimes, the FBI is offering five million dollars to anyone who can provide information. Five million dollars is not worth it. Five million is not worth it, and the two million they offer for the other dude is not worth it. It's because you're going to live in fear your entire life. ...leading to his arrest. Cook, yeah, cook. One of the things that makes it extremely difficult to track a suspect like Porky down is that he's taken every possible measure to fly under the radar. Although he's believed to still be in Honduras, he and his security team use untraceable numbers from Israel and Poland, and he goes to extreme lengths to keep his whereabouts a secret when he contacts his family. Although the hunt for Porky is far from over, he's likely to remain one of the most elusive and dangerous fugitives on the FBI's most wanted list for years to come. Yeah, y'all not getting no help with that one. Or the last one. Them last two, no average citizens helping. Alexis Flores. One seemingly peaceful afternoon in July 2000, five-year-old Ariana de Jesus was playing on the street it's in New Philadelphia with her really. sister and friends when her mom went out for a quick trip to the store. When her mom came back, she started living every parent's worst nightmare. Ariana had been taken by a suspicious man. Immediately, her mother reported... Start the story over. Because I want to make sure I heard everything. For years to come. Alexis Flores. Alexis Flores. One seemingly peaceful afternoon in July 2000, five-year-old Ariana de Jesus was playing on the street in Philadelphia with her sister and friends when her mom went out with her sister and friends, probably other three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds for a quick trip to the store. When her mom came back, she started living every parent's worst night. So she left her kids to play by themselves? Nightmare. Ariana had been taken by a suspicious man. Immediately, her mother reported her missing, triggering a citywide search for the five-year-old girl. In a de desperate effort to bring more attention to the disappearance, Ariana's family and friends covered every neighborhood wall. This a weirdo. This dude weird. This Flores guy. Light post and stop sign with flyers and missing posters, but nobody had any clue what had happened to the little girl. 
Unfortunately, after a few weeks of searching, the cops found her unresponsive in the basement of an abandoned apartment building just a few blocks away from where she had been taken. Disturbingly, the authorities also found a t-shirt featuring a bold political logo at the crime scene, which they deduced belonged to the suspect. During the investigation, a man came forward stating that he was pretty certain the t-shirt had belonged to a guy he only knew as Carlos, a drifter he had once employed as a handyman. Unfortunately, despite the promising lead, the case went cold for several years, leaving Ariana's family devastated and confused. It wasn't until 2007 that the authorities were able to analyze the shirt again thanks to recent advances in DNA technology, and what they found changed the course of the investigation forever. The DNA in the shirt was a perfect match with that of a man named Alexis Flores, who had been arrested in Arizona in 2002 for shoplifting and in 2004 for forgery. Unfortunately, by the time his DNA was linked to the crime, he had already been deported to Honduras years earlier for other, less serious crimes. As the police would later find, finding Alexis Flores was going to be a lot more difficult than they initially thought. Throughout his colorful criminal career, Alexis had provided multiple fraudulent dates of birth and names. Despite his inclusion in the most wanted list, the only things the FBI really knows about him are that Alexis is around 5'4", 130 pounds, and has visible scars on his forehead and Y'all not finding him, not in Honduras. Five foot five is the average height. This is this is the average build of a Honduran man. You cannot find in him. Right cheek. Due to his crimes, he's obviously also considered armed and extremely dangerous. With a quarter million dollar reward on his head for the crimes of kidnapping and That's murder, you would think that someone would have come forward with I repeated that little girl information on this guy, but 24 years after the crime, Alexis has remained unfound. She would have been 29. Wilver Villegas Palomino. The National Liberation Army, or ELN, Ain't no Americans on this list, huh? Or British people. And is a Marxist, Leninist, guerrilla insurgency group in Colombia, often referred to as Colombia's last true insurgency and one of Latin America's most powerful criminal organizations. In the past few years, the ELN has expanded aggressively into Venezuela, thanks to which the National Liberation Army now has over 6,000 active members. Interestingly, for the first few decades after its foundation, the group mostly focused their efforts on kidnapping, extortion, and attacking oil infrastructure. But over time, the ELN stopped shying away from drug trafficking and became deeply involved in the international drug trade, earning them the attention of the FBI. In 2023, Wilver Villegas Palomino became the 530th addition to the FBI's most wanted list on multiple serious charges ranging from narco-terrorism to murder to drug trafficking. Often running under the alias The Hog, Palomino is a high-ranking member of the National Liberation Army who's been involved in a 20-year conspiracy to distribute drugs from Colombia to the UN. I'm, sure, I'm still unsure what are the qualifications to get on the FBI's most wanted list. It sounds like murder for sure. Murder, but like, murder with fleeing. That's, that, I think that's the base qualification, like. Yes. Thanks to which, a warrant for his arrest was issued back in 2020. Wilver has also been accused of murdering multiple human rights advocates in Venezuela and the Catatumbo region in Colombia between 2017 and 2019. Due to his- He might be a serial killer high rank and his responsibility in flooding the streets of Houston and other major U.S. cities with drugs, the United States Department of State's Narcotics Rewards Program is offering a reward of up to five million dollars. Once again, this is one that you, you cooked. You're not getting him either. For information leading to Palomino's arrest. It'll be some years. As of today, it's a complete mystery where this guy is, but considering the ELN oversees the production of over 200 tons of drugs which are later distributed worldwide, obviously including the US, it makes sense why he was put on the list. Donald Eugene Fields II Oh, there's an American! Or what, what looks like, he looked like he's a hell angel leader or something. Since 2022, Donald Eugene Fields has been wanted by the FBI for the alleged trafficking of at least one child in Missouri between 2013 and- I, My bad, Hells Angels, I ain't mean it. In 2000- This is another weirdo. 17. According to the authorities, Fields took a 14-year-old girl and offered her to his friend Ted Sartori Jr. in exchange for cash, cars, motorcycles, vacations, and Christmas presents. Oh. 
Last known to live in Franklin County, Missouri, Fields has apparently been moving around the country since 2022, working sporadic jobs as a tree trimmer and independently selling used cars in an effort to fly under the radar. Based on court documents, it's believed that Donald probably took more than one victim, and that he might be hiding out with his girlfriend Jennifer Isgriggs, who is also wanted on a felony warrant for failure to provide child support. Since 2022, the cops have received multiple tips indicating that Fields spent so a weirdo and a deadbeat mom is out here. And some time in the Tampa area. And as soon as they heard that, they... Oh my God. Why would they, they gotta be in Florida. That's... He started running Facebook ads with his face on a most wanted poster to ask for the public's assistance in locating him. Unfortunately, it's likely that by then, Fields had already fled to Stover, Missouri. The FBI has also placed large billboards with Fields' face in cities where he's known to travel. But so far, it seems like he's managed to stay a step ahead of the cops. Earlier in 2024, Sartori, Fields' partner in crime, pleaded guilty to his charges and will face up to 30 years in prison. He'll also likely have to pay $25,000 in restitution to his victim. Based on court- That's not enough. That's not enough. Documents, he'll be officially sentenced in early November 2024. Oh, next month. In a couple days. As per the FBI's description of the suspect, Fields has multiple scars on his body as well as a tribal print tattoo on his right shoulder. With such a big effort being made by the FBI to make this guy's face known, hopefully someday he'll be recognized by someone and promptly turned into the authorities. There's a lot of weirdos on here. There's like three, four weirdos just... Then it's just some... some, some it, it's all weird, you know what I'm saying? I, well, I reiterate this. They're not catching the gangsters. It's too much loyalty, you know what I'm saying, in the third world countries. They're not doing it. It's not America where you can just wiretap and get that type of information. But this is very interesting, man. They're just doing for the UK. UK is most wanted.